So we're going to get this party started. So my name is Crystal, everybody. Again, I am the Center for Academic Success Director at Pierce College in Los Angeles. And I am also a coordinator for the California Community Colleges Success Network, or 3CSN for short. Um, and that is the statewide um, Chancellor's Office initiative uh, in California that um, uh, sponsors us as we put together all kinds of workshops and events and opportunities for educators from all over the place to get together, talk, discuss, exchange ideas, um, and think about how we can innovate and make powerful change at our campuses so we can create equitable and student-centered environments. I know that's a mouthful. What we do on Fridays at three o'clock is we uh, take 3CSN into learning assistance hour. That's where we talk SI leaders, tutors, peer mentors, uh, faculty members and staff that work in these amazing centers all come together and we share our practices. So every Friday, there's a different uh, practitioner um, who is uh, uh, leading a different discussion, a different topic, something related to learning assistance. And we're very, very happy that today we have someone who is um, who is two forms of learning assistance. So you're getting a bonus deal. The, our uh, Helen Morales, who is our presenter for today, is both a political science tutor and also a peer mentor, and has sees the students from both angles. And so she wanted to talk to us a little bit about what lessons we can learn from peer mentors as tutors and as um, SI leaders. So I'm really, really excited. It's going to be a very discussion-filled, um, um, uh, thoughtful-based uh, session. Um, and so with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Helen, who's going to share her screen and walk us through some awesome. Welcome aboard, Helen. Thank you. I just wanted to say before I share, thank you so much. I like, I love seeing everyone's boxes. It's, it just fills my heart up. So I really appreciate everyone who's here today. Um, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so here we go. Success tips from a peer mentor where mentoring and educating match up. Um, sorry, admitting someone already. Okay, let's take a deep breath. I do that for myself too. <laughs> we're going to get over it and we're going to get started. Okay, so our objectives and outcomes for today. We're going to be recognizing our personal definitions of success understand our role as student educators and how, you know, our great influence and what it carries there. We're going to be learning the difference between giving up and prioritizing our mental health. And we're also going to be practicing active listening with others. Let's get started. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. Um, sorry, I'm like moving around everyone. We will be talking about internal biases and success for the first hour. And if you'd like to stay around, we're going to have our discussion from 4 to 4.30. Um, we totally understand if you have to leave early, but if you can stick around, we definitely will appreciate that. And uh, we may send you links with additional materials within the chat. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, here is pretty much like the gist of Zoom. We have our reactions in the corner. If you like something, if you don't, please let us know. Um, and, and make sure to utilize the chat. We're going to be utilizing that feature all throughout our meeting. Here's our community agreement so that we can work best together. Please get ready to engage in the chat, reflect, and share your viewpoints. Please be mindful and kind to everyone around you. We all value our opinions, but just make sure to be respectful of one another. We'll be conducting breakout room sessions today. So if you were unable to participate, to, to participate, please let Lindsay know. Um, give yourself permission to explore new tools and ideas. This is a learning setting and we're all excited to have you here today. Please interact, use the chat, um, collaborative doc breakout and group share. Um, like I said, please be respectful. And confusion is great. Welcome confusion and questions. It's the first time you're probably gonna ever hear that here, <laughs> but confusion is amazing. We do encourage that. And like I said, please be kind, support others as they have questions and share um, observations. Let's go. So first slide here, we're gonna do a chat waterfall. So please take a moment um, to think about how you define success. Um, type it in the chat, but just hold off a little bit and we're all gonna hit enter at the same time. Um, I'm gonna give us like 60 seconds to do that. Really take your time and um, think about your holistic definition of success. What does that mean to you? Doesn't have to be exclusive to school or your family or anything like that. What do you think about it? I'll look at the timer right now. 
Okay, I think we're all ready to go. Are we ready with our definitions or do we still need a little bit more time? Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of thumbs up. Okay, let's go. Let's make the chat. I feel like so powerful when I do that. <laughs> Okay, let's look through everyone's fantastic and thoughtful definitions. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, success to me is enjoying whatever it is that I'm doing, achieving to my goals and being satisfied in my life. Goals and goals accomplished. Success is when you achieve what you set in front of you as a goal, meeting a chosen goal or benchmark, whatever I set for myself and or whatever others set for themselves. Stability and content with where I am, when everybody is well, not living in, living in harmony in nature, achieving your own realistic personal goals. Okay, these are awesome. Oh my gosh, these are really great. So as we can see, we have a bunch of different definitions. I, I'm like looking around and I don't think I, oh my gosh, I love that. Crush my enemies, see them driven by me, hear their lemon. That's, that's, I like that one. So now that we're going through the chat, we see that there isn't just one specific commonality. When we're looking through everything, everyone has their own specific interpretation of what success means. Let's debrief. So when we determine success, it clearly fluctuates between person to person. So here we obviously have to validate each individual truth because, you know, this is more of a subjective term. I can't just be like, Crystal, I define success as A, B, and C, and, you know, we can't just run off of that nature. So let's, let's keep this in the back of our mind. Let's reflect for a bit. Has there ever been a time where your definition of success has been challenged? That's a huge concept, okay? And again, it's subjective as well, but let's let's keep that in, you know, in the woodworks, okay? Has there ever been a time where your definition of success has been challenged? Okay, let's reflect. What is the difference between giving up and setting personal boundaries? We're not using the chat feature just yet. We're just going to keep this in the back burner right now, and I really want it to, you know, really manifest within us. What is the difference between giving up and setting personal boundaries? So let's take a few minutes to think to ourselves what this means. Once we're ready to move forward, let's, you know, let's keep it going. I'm going to give us a little, a little moment there. So I think we're good to go. I think everyone is like, I already know. <laughs> we're going to keep, we're going to keep it in the back of our minds and then we're going to keep going. Um, just try it. Thank you, Lindsay. That's so sweet. Okay. Okay. Jumping the ball here. What do we notice in these pictures? You go ahead, explode in the chat. This is not a trick question. I'm not, you know, there's no hidden like philosophical meaning here. What, what do we notice in these pictures here? What's going on? It's a guy with a lot of plates, right? Yeah. So I think this waiter was actually awarded um, the most like plate holding, like the most, like the person who has held the most plates at once. Um, he actually went on the news for actually using this technique to hand out a lot of plates. Um, yeah, so let's use that metaphor or something like that underlying for ourselves. Are you a massive plate holder? Now I know not everyone has worked in the customer service industry and that's totally fine. Arguably, I think that we all should one, you know, one time in our lives, but you know, let's think about it in our own, you know, livelihoods. Are we our own massive plate holders? Do we find ourselves over committing to too many tasks at once? Are we, you know, do we feel guilty for saying no to someone? And are we not kind to ourselves as a result of some kind of work burnout? Do we find ourselves pulling a bunch of all-nighters, eating un like through unhealthy patterns, putting our work over mental and physical stabilities? You know, we find ourselves being excessively stressed and fatigued. I mean, I can be the first to admit that I definitely have felt this way. And I feel like it's imperative to use something like holding a bunch of plates as a great metaphorical um, exemplification of something like that, right? So how can we fix this? Again, this is an extremely abstract concept that is going to vary between each person, but let's look at another picture that can help us. 
let's start by helping ourselves out. And initially, I think the best thing to start um, in order to, you know, combat this issue, it's like firstly recognizing it. We live in a culture where, you know, pulling eight all-nighters in one week is like the best thing to do. You know, the more stressed you are and utilizing 24 hours in a day just to add even more hours of the day, like is, is the best thing. We live in a culture where, you know, we're essentially, um, we're presented the ability to, um, we're living to work essentially. We're, we're, that's, that's pretty much it. We're not working to live, we're living to work. So when we look at this picture and I really liked it, not only because of the yummy food and I started getting a little hungry, <laughs> but the person who's holding the plates here, we can't really tell if they're putting one down or picking one up, right? And that's what I really, really liked about it in comparison to the person who's holding a bunch of things at once. Because once you come to a place where you are able to feel comfortable enough with yourself to be able to let go of something and put it down, a task or something like that, you might find yourself even being able to manage your time so much more sufficiently that you feel comfortable enough to pick something up. Super sweet, right? Again, it's a super abstract um, you know, principle that we're attacking here, but let's firstly talk about it and that's how we can solve these things. Have you ever had to give something up in order to be successful? How did it feel? Now, before you guys go ahead and take the mic, I wanted to give you an example that I personally went through. Last year, I had the privilege of being accepted into assembly member Gabriel's internship program. Okay, so I was so ecstatic when I got the interview and I was accepted, but I had severe health problems. I actually had a negative reaction to the Pfizer vaccine and my heart started to get swollen. And I don't say this in order to get sympathy points or to ask for someone's, I'm sorry, I hope you get better comments. You know, I mention this because when we live in a culture where it's so idolized to continue to put working in front of our health, it took so much from me to be able to be like, hey, hi, Jeremy, I'm sorry. I actually can't go in person on Wednesday and Friday from one to five. Actually, my heart is swollen and it's really hard for me to do that. It made me feel so much better now because one year later, if we look at the email, this was sent July 24th, 2021. My gosh, 2021 seems like it was forever ago, but it really wasn't. Um, I was actually offered the internship again, but in a virtual setting that would accommodate my ability to keep my health in mind. So initially, I mean, at the forefront, this looked like a terrible thing. You know, I, I felt bad for, I felt so much shame for having to decline this opportunity, but instead I had the opportunity to do it elsewhere. So can we open it up just a little bit? If anyone is comfortable enough to share their experience with, um, you know, this question, if you feel comfortable in shouting out anything, please go ahead and do so. Okay, I just thought of one. It takes me a second, right? I got to think about it a little bit. So I just thought of one though that I want to share. And um, the example that I want to share is not um, one that I chose. Because sometimes I think that that's, that's a powerful example, right? It's just like, if I ever had to give something up in order to be successful and how did it feel? Um, when I get really stressed out, when stuff just gets really overwhelming and crazy for me, um, I have really sort of like a structured life and some really high standards about uh, you know, what I, how well I need to eat and sort of like what, how often I'm supposed to exercise and take care of myself. Right. And one of the hardest things for me is sometimes to have to reevaluate sort of like how many walls I can hold up when other walls come at me. Right. So like, like before spring break, I feel like things were a little bit more relaxed and I was able to do all the things, right? Keep up the diet, keep up the exercise and keep up my house nice and clean and keep all of the, you know, like everything was structured and lovely. Um, but when work starts to get really heavy and hard, um, for me, sometimes I have to um, reevaluate, you know, how often I, you know, how long I spend exercising or how often I do the laundry or things like that so that I can sort of like rejigger um, the new demands of that week or that day. And I think that when I was younger, I would have a lot of shame about this. Like you can't, you know, you have to do all the things, right? You have to like be really amazing at work and you have to say yes to all the things. And you also have to, you know, cook all your own meals and keep your house clean and make sure you're going for walks every day and make sure you're not eating the wrong foods and all that stuff. And I think sort of like the older and sort of more mindful I get, the more I realized that like, sometimes it's okay to let go of some of those demands that I have on myself 
when other things are overwhelming, just temporarily. I know that I'm going to get back to laundry someday, but maybe when I have, you know, 20,000 different meetings and <laughs> I have, you know, four workshops to do, maybe this isn't the week that we get to all those things, right? And so I think that that's something that's come to me very hard over the years is that um, sometimes it's okay to put a plate down, knowing full well that the plate will be there and I can, I can pick it up later and there's no shame in that that's that's actually just a smart way to organize your time when things are overwhelming wow thank you so much for sharing i mean even like metaphorically and literally i could find myself sometimes like in during finals weeks when i just have sitting at my desk i have plates from the morning at lunch and dinner and i'm like oh my gosh i need to get to everything and it just gets really overwhelming but just taking it a day at a time is just so sweet thank you so much crystal i think i saw Lindsay with their hand up i'm I'm not sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know the hand color kind of melds in with the background. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because as Crystal was talking, I was thinking about um, kind of like a similar situation. Um, like I'm in a helping profession as a counselor and every time someone asks a question, for example, in like our Discord channel or something like that, or people want to get together and do something, um, I immediately always want to jump in and say yes and I'll do that and let me send you that link let me do that um but then all the responsibility becomes mine right or I'm depleting my energy to help others um and I think that last semester when I first started my job as an academic coach I realized like I can't always do that and there must be a limit and so there were certain things that um the, that my supervisors wanted me to do and I just said I can't there's not enough time in the week um where you're paying me that I can do that um and it was really hard for me to say that because I knew that I wanted to to do those things because I knew they'd help students but in the end like unpaid labor <laughs> and the amount of emotional energy it takes to continually be on is really challenging so I've definitely had to put a lot of that down and I think it made me more effective with my students because I had so much more energy and space for them. Thank you so much for sharing, Lindsay. I think that's such an imperative comment to share and I applaud you for being, you know, coming out and, and saying that. I feel like most of us here can definitely relate to something like that. You don't I mean, I would hear people all the time being like, unfortunately, there's only 24 hours in a day. I'm like, what do you mean? Unfortunately, you want to work even more? Oh my gosh. You know, like when you balance all of these things, you realize that you're, it's almost as if you're balancing all of those plates, but you're walking on like a little piece of rope, you know? And unfortunately, I guess like, it seems like something, there's always going to be something due before 1159. And you're always going to have to send an email back to somewhere, you know, like you just have to make sure that your health is intact. So thank you so much for sharing. Camry, would you like to go? Last uh, fall, I was working on my project for my thesis and my grandfather died. And then two weeks later, my uncle died. So I had to just step away from my project because I needed to focus on my emotional success, on how I would handle the trauma so I, I had to just step away because I couldn't do the project school and handle that many, uh, too many deaths in just a short time. So I had to just step away and start it up when once I, I had the energy to actually be able to work on the project, which was hard, but I, it was something I needed to do because I was overstressed. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I can definitely relate to something like that when a family member passes away and you know, corporate America is always going to be there. We're always, there's always going to be another task to do. And, you know, and prioritizing the fact that a life, you know, is, is there and, you know, honoring that person and yourself is, is so important, you know, and unfortunately there are, are places where like, they're like, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you still have to clock in tomorrow. And I feel like, you know, just owing it to like, for instance, like Crystal, I've talked to her about, you know, my problems and like other people at Pierce and they're so understanding. So thank you so much for sharing that. Would anyone else like to share before we move forward? Okay, I think I'm taking that as a cue to keep going. Perfect. Thank you so much to everyone who shared.
let's keep going. So yeah, so I'm glad that some people were able to relate in, in some way of, you know, success and recognizing that, you know, prioritizing yourself is not selfish. That is just being a, like kind to yourself almost and trading. Sometimes we treat others with higher respect than we do with ourselves, unfortunately. So now that we have some sort of outlook on ourselves, I wanted to provide an anecdotal piece um, that actually happened, but in order to, um, you know, secure the privacy of the people involved, I changed the information. Um, now, this is going to be an understanding of an analyzation of a two T's perspective, the way that we talked about our um, perspectives with success um, as tutors, as student educators, as, you know, workers. Let's take a dive into, um, into a student's perspective. So let's see. Bella is a history major with a 4.0 GPA. She has been struggling in a calculus one class, which mind you, for those of you who want the specifics, typically a math class is needed for the IGETSI requirement. So even though she's a history major, she needed a, a math class. So that's why, that's why she was there. Um, so in order to facilitate her learning, uh, she would attend tutoring for four to five hours a day utilize her professor's office hours, and complete additional practice problems on top of her assigned work. Despite her efforts, she still has an F in her class. So the example that I'm going to be presenting here is what do we do when we have, you know, when we suggest all of the successful resources and, you know, um, scheduling that a successful student would do, and it still fails. Here's how her tutor reacted. When Bella suggested that she might have to withdraw from her class, her tutor told her that she shouldn't give up. Some of the comments that her tutor said went as follows. If you keep reading hard, I think you can pass the class. If you think that withdrawing is a good idea, that's okay. Personally, I would stick it out. And Calc 1 is tough, but it's all about the time and effort that you put in. Keep in mind, tutors do this from good faith, right? Now that we see the little comments and stuff, let, let's debrief a little bit. Bella's tutor didn't suggest the things that she did because she wanted to be mean or hurtful or be like, you know, you need to do this a certain way or you're going to fail and trample. No, that's not what she was doing. It was not out of malice. It was out of great intent. And I'm sure that we have all found ourselves as, you know, tutors, peer mentors, et cetera, et cetera, in situations where we probably feel like we're giving like great advice. Um, Okay, so instead the tutor believed that they were helping her. Um, this is a clear example of imposing our own standards of success on someone else. And we're gonna continue this idea throughout this entire presentation. Um, I just really wanted to point as an, as an anecdotal example um, after we already mentioned our, you know, ideals with success, our differing opinions and things like that so that we can further be able to be, um, you know, create mindfulness within the work setting. So here's our solution. We need to be aware of our own personal expectations of success before helping others. Think of this um, as an internal bias. You know, I know that word has been, you know, beginning, beginning to get um, extremely politicized, but it really shouldn't be, in my opinion. And in this case, when we say internal bias, think of it like if I presented you three different colors and I was like, hey, hey, Lindsay, do you like red, yellow or blue? Maybe, maybe Lindsay might have a bias to the color blue. That doesn't mean that, you know, they hate red and yellow or all the other colors, you know, this just means that you have some sort of affinity for that. In the same way that we discussed that we have different definitions of success, same way that we impose that when we're in real world situations. Another point. We can't just put ourselves in someone else's shoes. The only thing that changes is our outward appearance, but our internal values reside the same. I know that, you know, this is meant to be a quote where we're able to be like, you know, you just put yourself in someone else's shoes and then you'll probably see what they're gonna be doing. Well, the way that I look at someone else is I'm just, you know, making a caricature of what that person is. And then I'm putting myself in that fixation, right? I'm not really getting it down to the issue. I'm just being like, well, you know, this is what I think Bella's like. Let me just, what would Bella think? And then internally, I still have my same values, my same perspectives, my same life experiences, nothing changes. Instead, we're probably flaming the fire more by, you know, creating a caricature of that person. Instead, 
Let's empower others to describe themselves as they want to be seen, right? Instead of fixating something or turning something around in order to fit our personal um, notions, let's instead let that person describe their situation and let them be heard, you know? Let's listen intuitively and actively in order to really understand what is going on. So let's recap. I know earlier I said to hold something in the back of your mind and we're gonna be revisiting that topic. In the end, Bella decided to withdraw from her class. This not only improved her mental health, but she was able to spend more time studying for the classes that she loved. We've probably heard of this kind of example uh, a few times in their lives. This is a perfect example of setting a personal boundary and not giving up. What was your initial interpretation of giving up and setting boundaries? Did it change after listening to this example? So we're taking that concept back from the back burner and we're putting it on the stove. Did anyone, um, you know, did anyone's perspective on this concept change? Did it stay the same? Are you neutral? You know, what do we think? We can give ourselves a little bit of time before we completely answer that question. And please feel free to utilize the chat if, if you can. I know some people have, you know, some personal obstructions to, you know, speaking, which is totally fine and valid. Um, okay. I'll just give us a few minutes. Oh, Crystal, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I didn't see your sure. hand. I just wanted to validate some of the discussion that's happening in the chat because I really think that it it, it addresses um, the question that you've asked here about like you know giving up and success and some of the advice that that tutor provided. Um, and that is, um, you know, folks are saying things like sometimes effort isn't enough right grit isn't enough and sometimes this is a myth that we that we have for ourselves right i just need to work harder 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 and we're all a bunch of very overachieving individuals otherwise we wouldn't be spending our friday afternoon hanging out together and learning about um how to improve our practice which makes us amazing and at the same time the old sort of like if i were in your shoes really does sort of eliminate the other person. And we just really appreciate that that we're talking about not putting yourself in another person's shoes, but listening to where where another person um, is and how they describe themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing in the chat um, folks saying things like, um, we do have to stop and process our lives and emotions. Um, and self-compassion is so key, something that is underrated and something that we all need. Um, and the importance that, you know, of importance of pointing out that time and effort doesn't always work. Miriam talked about toxic positivity. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, she says that she read that so somewhere the other day. I'm wondering, Miriam, could you tell us a little bit more about toxic positivity and what, what it was that you read the other day? Uh, actually, it's on a um it's called big life journal which is like a parenting thing which is a growth mindset outlet um it's online and it says to avoid toxic positivity especially when you talk to younger people and that instead of like saying it's not a big deal or just stay positive you could say that it's okay to feel uncomfortable and um you know, with difficult emotions or feelings that, um, you know, validating someone's experiences, saying it's okay um, not to feel okay sometimes. So those feelings won't be suppressed or even avoided. So instead of like saying, um, it's fine, you'll, you, you'll do good. The more tutoring sessions you get, you, you'll be better. You could say, it's fine if you're not good and Calc 1, um, you know, we often feel like we're not good at certain things and we're better at others. And that's just how it is. Uh, it's fine to feel uncomfortable or to feel comfortable with certain things. It's like the approach where you don't have to budge somebody into like being always positive it's, it's going to be okay every time, you know, because not every time is going to be okay. And sometimes that's okay too. Right. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal, for monitoring the chat. You know, it's kind of hard to like do everything at once. I've been in meetings before where I have to do both and it's just crazy. But I'm sure some of you guys can, you know, be amazing at that. You know, back to what um, Miriam was saying, that just reminds me of, I hope this is on topic, but kind of like Disney has been getting a little bit of heat for how every story has to end in a happy ending. And that's like unrealistic for so many people, because when you, when you're, you know, exemplifying something, a lifestyle where everything's going to be okay, you know, the good person is always going to win, you know, realistically for us who are real human beings. And, you know, you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, like my, my life isn't all unicorns and rainbows. You know, I can't just use a magic spell to get everything, you know, the way that I want, you know, unfortunately I don't have any talking bunnies and frogs everywhere. <laughs> um, so I think that's really important to know. And I think, um, validating realistic expectations and not always just being, uh, you know, like it's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. Because then if it's not that case, then what are we really going to do? I just, it just points out, I feel like us as tutors where, you know, when you have a 2T ask you, for instance, like, do you think I'm going to get an A? And, you know, we're not supposed to be like, oh yeah, for sure. Of course you are. It's kind of like, it reminds me of people who are in the medical field where, you know, you are in these harsh cases and, you know, there are going to be people like family members of patients who are like, you know, is, is my loved one going to be okay? And you have to find a way to navigate that question that is not only going to comfort that person, but give them a realistic perspective. So I think that answer like completely answers everything holistically. Thank you so much. You should be the one presenting. <laughs> um, just a couple more things in the chat, Helen. I just see a lot about validation and listening rather than trying to solve, right? So like we, we have an instinct to want to solve the problem. Here's what you need to do in order to pass your class, where um, a lot of folks in the chat are just talking about the importance of listening and and um and letting the student lead and Lindsay Ann says how others um, how we see um how we see others may not be how they see themselves even if we have the best intent and there's still process yes and that's the perfect reason why we can't really put ourselves in others in someone else's shoes you know I mean I would hear that you know unfortunately sometimes we say that from a place of privilege almost I mean, you would hear some people say that to people who are in unfortunate situations. You're like, just put yourself in their shoes. Like, what would you do? Well, you're just making a caricature of what you think that that person is going through, right? And we don't want to do that in academia and, in, you know, interpersonal relationships, anything like that. Like is being mentioned in the chat, we need to empower people to express themselves the way that they are and validate that. We can't just provide solutions and solutions, you know, these People are human beings. We're not math problems, you know. Like it's funny. Calc one is like an example, but um, maybe it's it's on my mind. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing. Would anyone else like to add anything? Mm. Oh yeah, Inside Out. Love that movie. Okay, so I think would it be good to keep moving on? I think so. Perfect. So let's recap from our previous topic. Um, in the end, Bella decided to withdraw from her class and, um, oh yeah, we already did that. So sorry about that. High five. You are ready to go into breakout rooms. Congratulations, everyone. If I saw you guys all in person, I would give you guys a bunch of high fives really fast. Like I'm a celebrity. Um, we're about to go into breakout rooms. So that's going to be super, um, exciting. Let's go over the discussion protocol. Um, when you go into your rooms, please, please, please introduce yourselves, um, your name, your pronoun, your college, and your role. Um, please discuss what advice you would give to the tutor and or to the student. I'm going to be providing some scenarios and they're going to be showed up on the screen and they're also going to be posted in the chat for your convenience. Um, what assumptions is the tutor making about the student's behavior? How would you advise a tutor to actively listen? These are, you know, these questions are going to start to make sense once I show you the scenarios. And we're also going to be putting in those questions um, in the chat for your convenience as well. You're going to have four to six minutes to discuss and please be ready to share your answers when we return. Okay, so I think we're going all swell so far. So this is scenario one. Um, like I said, it's going to be posted in the chat. So please don't freak out. It's all good. Um, okay. 
Jordan is a science tutor. Gotta love them. They love to help anyone who comes their way. However, they started to encounter a problem with the biology student, Martin, who comes in every single day and stays for their entire working hours. Martin prefers to complete all of his homework with the tutor and asks Jordan to help him with every single problem that he has. As a result, Jordan began to feel frustrated because he didn't know how to get Martin to do his own work. What advice would you give to Martin and Jordan? Please discuss that in your breakout rooms. I think, you know, we got the people who are in charge of that doing their little magic. And I am going to, uh, can, can I stop sharing my screen so I can copy and paste it? Perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> Always a good sign when nobody comes back until the timer is up. So thanks. Thanks for engaging in that conversation. All right. So we'd love to hear what you came up with. What, what, what biases did you see? What judgments? What advice? What did we come up with? Go ahead, Cameron. So I, our group talked about like in this situation, the tutor is kind of making the assumption that the student is helpless in the material. When when I was when we were talking about was it might not be that they're helpless it's that they lost confidence within their own skills because when Sutees have a test that they fail not because you know everybody thinks they're going to do great in a test and then they they mess up on it and then suddenly their confidence is shot and then they're second guessing themselves all the way through the assignments and so it might be the problem here is not that the student requires the help that they think they do it's they require the confidence to actually be able to do this. And so we we're talking about one of the things we would do is, is tell them that we're not always confident ourselves, that we don't know all the answers either, that um, let's look at our notes and talk about things that we do know for sure, what are things we have definitive knowledge of, and then work with that knowledge base that they've established and written down to help maybe rebuild their own confidence in the material, because a lot of times they're just second guessing themselves. I've had it countless times where they go, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, well, you just gave me the correct answer. So it's clear that you just are not confident in your skills but you do have skills. So I try to reaffirm that they are competent, that they actually do know what they're doing as opposed to try to confirm some idea of incompetence, inability, not, not able to perform. Because then when we do that, we shut down our skills. So I would try to try to more focus on like confidence in that situation. Perfect. I think that was that was awesome. Oh my gosh. I want to give you like a round of applause. That was amazing. I really like the fact that you mentioned and you clarified the fact that, you know, these students do have, you know, the skills and stuff in order to do that. I've taken math classes before where they're like, you know, typically, at least in that realm of classwork, um, you know, if you feel unsure about yourself, you're, you're somewhat there. I mean, you have the skills. It's not that you're like, you have this genetic, you know, DNA code that's like you can't do it. it it's that like you have it we just need to you know do a you know a little bit more confidence there um let's see um just the chat we've also looks like uh, Lindsay Ann was talking about how um they had a group Connie Jody and Lindsay that were talking about focusing on those student strengths I'm wondering if somebody in that group would would mind uh, unmuting themselves and telling us what happened in that conversation please I just want to talk about um, how Connie had mentioned earlier, how um, we should find out about how the students are feeling about their classes, whether it's that one biology class, as well as other classes that they're taking, so we get to learn more about who that student is and how they're learning so that we can personalize their learning because at the end, right, as tutors, we want these students to become, in, you know, um, independent learners. Thank you. Connie, what would you add to that? Uh, um... Well, I, I mentioned how um, uh, at the moment uh, I talked with the ladies about a student that I'm actually spending more time than I usually do. And uh, um, because I'm an English tutor and uh, at a community college and high school students come to a community college at all different levels of writing. And so I'm actually, it, it's amazing the, the different levels. And, um, and yet they're all in the same class and they're all expected to do the same assignments. And so, uh, um, so I'm spending extra time right now just um, helping the student build their, their writing skills. 
And I explained to them, oh, you're building your writing skills and you're gonna have your little skills toolbox. And uh, because you're gonna be doing a lot of writing in college and you're learning now to, you know, different steps to take to put a essay together you know, and uh, so it, it, it lets them know that they are uh, building what they, they're, they're getting what they need so that they can do the work. Thank you so much for sharing. That was awesome. Lindsay, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, something Connie just said made me think of a session I had with a student this week where, um, the student wanted to focus on building their confidence. And so I started to ask questions and try and figure out, you know, why they didn't feel confident and, um, you know, what was kind of the stem of that issue. And uh, we came around to the conclusion that the student didn't feel safe um, because when she was younger, I work with students with disabilities. So when she was younger, she was one of the students who went to a resource class and everyone knew she was, they all thought she was dumb because she had to go to the resource class. So um, people would talk about her. And um, so she always felt the scrutiny. She always felt like she was stupid. Um, and compared to her non-disabled uh, sister, she really felt like a failure. So um, that just built and built and built. And now she's a almost senior in college and she still feels this way. Um, and so sometimes it's something big that happened a long time ago too, that is impacting their confidence. And for her, she's like, oh, well, I'm thriving in this research class. And I was like, well, what's different? And we had the conversation around, does she feel safe in the classroom? And it really was about that safety. So I think just knowing that classrooms could be a very unsafe place being in the tutoring center around a bunch of people who seem like they know what they're doing, can it can feel unsafe. And that might be why Martin is focusing so much um, on making sure he's doing every little thing right um, and really needing Jordan to support um, that process. And so it might be helpful to figure out, you know, what it is exactly that Martin feels like he's missing and kind of feel that instead. Right. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh my gosh, we're on a roll with this. Crystal, would you like to go ahead? Oh man, Lindsay, I just really want to say that I, I, this was a true story. Obviously the names have been changed and I talked to the student at length and um, I did some active listening with the student and what the student said after, I and mean, we, we talked for like 45 minutes about like what was going on and you know, how he studies and all that stuff. Um, uh, and what he said at the end of our conversation was, um, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, right? This wasn't the most fun conversation I've ever had, but, you know, this was really helpful. He said, you know, sometimes I don't want to study alone because I'm just so, I'm, I just, I'm so afraid of getting it wrong that I just, it gives me so much anxiety, right? That I can't focus. And what I thought of when I was talking to him was that notion of affective filters, right? So, um, affective filters are what happens to our brains when we um, when we detect threat, um, when we're when we're nervous, right? Because we think somebody's going to judge us, or we're afraid of making a mistake. Sort of our front, our prefrontal cortex that does all the critical thinking kind of gets bypassed a little bit, and we become really sort of like emotionally reactive, and it actually makes it harder for us to think critically, right? We call it an affective filter, right? Because of the affect, there's this filter up over our thinking, right? And so sometimes that anxiety, those feelings that come from maybe past experiences or, you know, the fear of being judged or, you know, confirmation bias or stereotype threat can, can actually block the learning. And I think that that, that was what was happening with that particular student. And at the end of the conversation, he was like, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and try a little bit of this on my own and write down questions and come back for the tutor. But I think it really took um, him to process that and to hear that he was capable, right? And I sometimes think that we skip that part. You know, we talk about growth mindset and it's effort, and it, but sometimes we just need to tell students that they're capable, they're smart enough, they're good enough, right? That, they, that they've got this. 
Um, and if they don't, that's okay too. <laughs> so thank you for that, Lindsay. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I think with that, we're kind of coming to a close with our meeting, but yeah, I don't know. I think we, we have a few more minutes. So I just, I just wanted to quickly say, I really appreciate everyone for coming on here. Initially, I was so nervous like um, to present. I was talking with Crystal and I think everything that was discussed today completely is true and valid. And I feel the same way that we're talking about validating other people. I feel like everyone in this meeting did that for me. I hope I was able to radiate that same energy um, back. Uh, but yeah, I definitely agree with the fact that we labeled the term laziness as like uh, this, this terrible thing without really taking the holistical analysis or approach to a human being. Um, I mean, I've been, you know, like, treated that way and it's not the best feeling when you are kind of categorized in this box of like no you're, well you're just lazy and then you completely disregard the fact that someone's probably going through a lot of things in their household and a lot of things at home or a lot of things internally so I just really appreciate everyone for being so emotionally intelligent and aware and yeah I really appreciate everyone for being on here again. Wonderful. And Preston is giving us some really great details about affective filter and what it does to the brain. Mm -hmm. um, Pre Preston, did you want to share any of that or emphasize any of that effects on learning? Uh, well, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, so your nervous system doesn't really know the difference between physiological stressors and dangers and emotional stressors and dangers. You, you can't, you behave exactly the same way you would if somebody was threatening you if somebody was trying to kill you physically. And uh, when you think uh, about what behaviors tend to get you out of the situation, um, none of them are deep thinking philosophy kinds of uh, uh, behaviors. They're all, so attentional focus, it, it narrows dramatically. You have a tunnel vision. You, it's as if you're only looking for cues that might help you survive the situation. And that does not include math. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much. I did. Oops, I just muted myself. I put some links in the chat. Um, for those of you who are leaving at four, I respect you and I love you and I get it. But do check out the links in the chat before you go. If you're going to stay, we're going to continue and talk more about this. But um, if you want to come back next week, we're doing how to manage awkward situations. So what, what do you do when stuff gets weird with your student? We're going to talk about setting boundaries and being strengths-based, but at the same time, you know, making sure that you're taken care of and that, that the learning is moving forward and boundaries are not getting overstepped. So we're going to talk a lot about that next week. It's going to be awkward and weird, and I'm going to love it. It's like my favorite workshop to do, so please come back. Um, also, if you'd like to do one of these in fall 22, Centralia College, I'm looking at you, maybe not Preston, he's got his finger on his nose, but maybe some of those peer educators from Centralia College, we'd love to see you come and uh, show your stuff. So in the chat, there's a link to register for next week. There's also a link to um, apply to present next semester. And finally, there is a, um, a link to some feedback that we really love and need um for our own work going forward and thank you for everybody who's filled out that feedback form in the past i'm told that we have an amazing looking community based on our feedback so we really appreciate you so if you're gonna leave leave if you're gonna stay stay but whatever you do just stay rad we just we just appreciate you so very much mm.